30 plus years, I've seen every type of child grow up. Instead of giving me what I wanted, she gave me what I needed, which was truth. Don't let emotions win. Let truth win. Do your very best, and you should have a lot of fun while you do it. And the better you get at something, the more fun you're going to have at something. You moms and dads are wired with everything you need to be a parent to a great kid. Welcome to Parenting Great Kids. This is episode number 26, Raising Great Boys. I'm your host, Dr. Meg Meeker. Today, I will be speaking with boy guru and my friend, one of the smartest men I know, Dr. Leonard Sachs. He's the author of Boys Adrift. We're going to be talking about the challenges boys face today and how you, their parent or grandparent, aunt or uncle if you're listening, can raise strong, self-confident men. I want to turn now and have you listen in on a conversation that I had with Dr. Sachs about raising great boys. I know you're going to enjoy it as much as I did. Well, Dr. Sachs, you're an MD, you're a PhD psychologist, uh, which is a fabulous combination, and you wrote a book called Boys Adrift. So I personally consider you somewhat of a boy guru, Um, and you talk about a phenomenon that I see in my pediatric practice as well, and that is that many boys are growing into young adults who don't have adequate motivation they're underachievers and when you look at the studies we're seeing girls really passing boys by in droves as far as you know how many are graduating from high school how many graduating from college how many are going on to graduate school and so forth what's going on with our boys well indeed you'll find in the very same family uh, parents will tell you you know my daughter is working hard double major at university extremely successful high school And my son is a goofball who graduated high school, went to college for a few years, dropped out. He's back at home playing video games in the basement. And he's perfectly content with that. Parents are pulling their hair out. A son spends his time playing video games, looking at pornography, and works a few hours a week at the coffee shop. And the parents are, where is this coming from? Our daughter is so successful and and our son is a goofball. And... The foundation is really quite different. Uh, What girls are looking for is different from what boys are looking for. And what you'll find is that a lot of boys feel very comfortable in their world because they feel that they've accomplished a great deal because they completed all the missions in Call of Duty and Grand Theft Auto. And they're hanging out with a group of guys. And what will impress the guys in that group is if you finished all the missions in Call of Duty and Grand Theft Auto, uh, working hard at your job or working hard at university to get a four-year degree is not going to raise your status in the eyes of those boys. So the society has changed and the technology has created new challenges. And a lot of parents don't understand, for example, how video games have disengaged boys from the real world and when you talk to parents I sometimes find that when you talk to them about video games they're thinking about Pac-Man or Pong and they're like how would anyone get addicted to a video game and I say look you need to watch these video games they're compelling the physics are very real Mm -hmm. and It's not easy to complete all the missions in Call of Duty and Grand Theft Auto. It will take many hours of time and effort. And so these boys feel like they're great achievers, Mm -hmm. but they're in their own little world. And that world leads nowhere. You know, you and I have talked about the issues that children face with screen time, particularly social media for girls and video games for boys. Right. Why do boys become so addicted? And then why are these games so harmful? You, you just began touching on that. So let's dig a little deeper into that. Okay. So many boys have this aggressive impulse. They want to conquer. They want to win. They want to be king of the world. And school has changed in a way that has really criminalized that. Even two boys throwing snowballs at one another can now commonly in the United States get in big trouble. Throwing snowballs absolutely prohibited at most American schools. Pointing fingers at each other saying, bang, bang, you're dead, can get you in trouble at American schools. And the result is that a lot of boys say, school's stupid. I'm going to go home and play Grand Theft Auto. And the video games totally get this. Mm. And if a boy invests time and effort in a game like Call of Duty, Assassin's Creed, Grand Theft Auto, 
and gets really good at shooting other people and not getting shot himself, he will conquer. He will be the master. So for many boys, this really feeds into something primal. That's not true for girls. Girls are much less likely to get a big thrill out of killing 20 aliens, as you do in Halo, for example. Mm -hmm. But boys do. And because of these differences between girls and boys, boys are much more prone to get addicted to video games. So clearly you don't believe in gender neutrality here, because, which I, of course, don't either, because what you've really just described is an enormous difference between the mind set and the mind of a girl versus a boy. And you're absolutely right on. And I think that parents need to recognize this. You know, boys... Early on, you know, you look at these little toddlers. My grandson is, you know, 18 months old and he loves books about trucks and cars and things that move. And I can put a book about, you know, Peppa Pig in front of him and then I can put a book with a lot of trucks and things and he always gravitates that. So it continues through life where boys like this aggressive challenge. They like to see things move and do things. And and we need to accept this. I think this whole idea of gender neutrality is so it's such a joke and it's so hard for our kids and we do such a huge disservice to them because we want to take a lot of the traditionally masculine character qualities out of boys like no you can't throw snowballs because you're going to be a bully well okay we're not advocating violence at school here but there's a huge difference between that and saying you know boys behave and think differently than girls right from the get-go well, and you can channel that in ways that are very constructive, and you can make a school friendly to boys without making it unfriendly to girls. So St. Andrews is a school I visited up north of Toronto, and they have a very simple rule. If you want to throw snowballs, go to the football field. If you don't want snowballs thrown at you, then don't go to the football field. It's a very simple rule. It's worked very well. And I've worked with schools across the United States and Canada to implement that. Now, some schools, when they do that, they'll require parents to sign a letter that the lawyer has drawn up saying if somebody gets hurt, yeah. that the school will be held harmless. They have a bucket of goggles, and you have to put on goggles before you go out to throw snowballs so that nobody gets an eye injury. Yeah. But they've had no problems with this. And you know, when you do this at a co school, you'll find that about 80% of the kids throwing snowballs are boys, but about 20% are girls. Hmm. Some girls like to throw snowballs. Sure. Some boys don't like to throw snowballs. That's fine. Gender is complicated. But create a space on the school property where kids can throw snowballs at one another. Because what's happening right now in most American schools is two boys are throwing snowballs and teacher runs out and says, what are you guys doing? Not to do that here. You want to throw snowballs? Go somewhere else. Leave the school. And the unspoken message the boys are getting is, hey, school's not the place for you. Mm. School's not. Boys doing things that boys have always done now gets boys in trouble. Yeah. If I can segue into that, if you don't mind. So I was at another American school, 10th grade English. Assignment was to write a story about anything you like. And a boy wrote a, a story about the Battle of Stalingrad, winter 1942. And the story is told from the perspective of a Russian soldier on patrol who's ambushed by a German who's trying to stab him with a knife. And the Russian fires his rifle at point-blank range into the face of the German soldier. And then the boy describes what happens when you fire a rifle in another man's face, what happens is the head explodes, and a piece of brain goes this way, a piece of eyeball goes this way, a piece of chin goes that way. This boy was suspended from his school, and the parents were told he would not be allowed to return until they had obtained an assessment from a licensed professional, assuring the school that the boy posed no imminent danger oh. to himself or to others. And when the parents shared that story with me, it really struck a chord, because I wrote a similar story. 1977, lead teacher for English at our high school, Shaker Heights High School in Ohio, now nominated me and three other students to sit for a competition uh, administered by National Council of Teachers of English, NCTE. Uh, so the proctor gives each of us a blue book and says, you have 45 minutes, write a story. So I wrote a story about East German refugees trying to escape to West Germany, crossing a minefield in the middle of the night, and one of them steps on a mine. Just before he gets to the border, he steps on a mine, it blows off his left leg to the hip, right leg to the knee, so now he's crawling west, blood pouring out of the stumps where his legs used to be. The East German guards are shooting at him, but missing, and the West German guards are calling out to him, at blood pouring out of his legs, and finally reaches the border, and the guards lift him to take him to the hospital, and he dies. The end. So my own mom died in September 2008, and I was going through her papers after her death and found that she had saved 
the certificate sent to our home in 1977 by the National Council of Teachers of English, awarding me their highest honor in creative writing. Wow. Boys have always written about traumatic amputation and violent death. It used to get you an award. Now it can get you suspended. Boys doing things that boys have always done, as I just said, can get you in trouble. And the result is that a lot of boys say, school's stupid. School's for girls. I'm going to go home and play Grand Theft Auto. Yeah. Uh, you can make the school friendly to boys without making it unfriendly to girls. You know, I love that because you're absolutely right. We're such a conflicted society and we don't want to accept the fact that a boy writes about this is his way of sort of processing things. And his imagination is so important. And, you know, Bruno Bettelheim wrote about this as well and sort of saying it's so important for us to be thinkers. And that's how boys sort of resolve a lot of things. And it's a wonderful thing to write a story like that and um, to pick through that. Let's talk about how else are schools causing trouble for boys? Because you're absolutely right. A lot of boys in elementary school in particular feel like they don't fit. Uh, Another change that has been harmful to boys disproportionately is the acceleration of the early curriculum. 30 years ago, kindergarten was about playing duck, duck, goose and finger painting and singing in rounds. Now, in almost all American schools, kindergarten is about learning to read and write. Mm -hmm. In other words, kindergarten has become first grade. Mm -hmm. Uh, We now ask five-year-olds to sit still and learn about phonics uh, in 60 or 90-minute sessions, and that is not developmentally appropriate Mm -hmm. for many five-year-old boys. And five-year-old boys have more difficulty sitting still and being quiet than five-year-old girls do, and the result is the teacher sends a note home and says, you know, Justin's having trouble sitting still and being quiet. You should get him evaluated. Mm -hmm. And in this country, if that child goes to a child psychiatrist, odds are very high that that psychiatrist is going to prescribe a medication like Adderall, Vyvanse, Ritalin, Concerta, Metadate, Focalin, Detrana. And I have led workshops for the child psychiatrist. And they have said, look, if this kid comes in and I give him the medication, everybody's happy. He he sits still, teacher's happy, parent's happy, everybody's happy. If I say, look, the problem here is not so much with the child, but with the school. The school is doing it wrong. They shouldn't expect five-year-old boys to sit still and be quiet for an hour at a time. I'm going to get in trouble. The principal is going to contact uh, our medical director and say that I'm bad-mouthing the school. I'm going to get bad comments. The parents were coming in expecting a medication, and I didn't give them one. I'm going to get bad reviews on Yelp and on Google. You know what? I'll write the prescription, everybody's happy. If I don't write the prescription, everybody gets in trouble. I actually published a scholarly article, uh, got uh, sent out questionnaires to hundreds of child psychiatrists and pediatricians and asked them, who is suggesting the diagnosis and what do you do next? And published a scholarly article on this topic. And it was just a questionnaire, but the doctors wrote these essays. And we, we said at the back, is there anything you'd like to add? And they wrote these essays saying, look, I really don't want to do this. Mm-hmm. I'm not at all convinced this is in the child best interest, but mm-hmm. I feel like I don't have a choice. Because yeah. American culture is all about doing it earlier, doing it right. faster. And we now have so much good research that this acceleration is harmful. And it's harmful to both girls and boys, but it has resulted in boys disengaging altogether Mm. from school and regarding school as unfriendly to boys. So what do you say to a parent of a second grade boy who comes in and you don't really think he has ADHD? He's bouncy. He's having a hard time focusing. He maybe is not reading very well. But he's a happy kid. Rather than giving that parent medication for that child, what do you suggest the parent do? Very often, I'll recommend that we change the school. I will say, look, let's find a different school that's more experiential, that's more outdoors, that's Mm -hmm. hands-on, like a Montessori school or a Waldorf school, mixed grades where, uh, or you know what? Let's repeat second grade, but at a different school with Mm -hmm. a different peer group. So he won't have that sense of being held back. You never want to hold a child back at the same school because then you're sending a message to that child. You're so dumb. You can't even go on to the next grade with your peers. If you're going to hold a child back, and often that's a good intervention for these boys. They need to be in a grade that's doing things that are more age appropriate for them. So start them over at second grade at a different school with a more outdoor curriculum, a more hands-on curriculum. And that's been very helpful in some cases. Yeah. Are you an advocate of single-sex schools? 
if it's the right school. You know, I actually took a five-year sabbatical for medical practice because I was so impressed by uh, some of the uh, boys' schools I had visited. Fifteen years ago, I visited a boys' school, third-grade classroom, and the boys were all jumping up and down to spell the word abbreviate. And afterwards, they left, and I said to the teacher, where are the chairs? There are no chairs in this classroom. And she said, well, Dr. Sachs, everybody knows when an eight-year-old boy sits down, his brain shuts off. I said, well, excuse me, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. But you'll find, I found a lot of boys' schools really did understand that and were very boy-friendly. So if there is such a school nearby and it's boy-friendly uh, and they understand how to do this, then that's great. But there aren't many such schools. There are not many boys' elementary schools in the United States. Mm -hmm. So that often is simply not an option, or if it's an option, it's crazy expensive and parents cannot afford it. But if you live in a major urban area, there are other schools, and you can find one that is more boy-friendly that understands this. And if you can't find one, then you have to move. And I'm not telling parents to do anything we didn't do ourselves. My wife and I were living in rural Maryland, and we felt there was no school that was a good fit for our daughter. So we moved from Maryland to Chester County, Pennsylvania for our daughter to be near the school that she has now attended for the past six years. Parents, I hope you're enjoying this conversation with Dr. Leonard Sachs. We need to take a quick break right now, but don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. So let's try to just pull this all full circle because we started our podcast talking about how boys are growing into young adults without motivation. And um, so do you feel that it, the, the combination here of what video games are giving boys and how schools have changed for boys and how boys can often be mislabeled and given medications that they really don't need, is this all playing into raising a boy that's going to turn out unmotivated and sort of hit his early 20s and go, I just don't like any of this? It is. And again, that piece regarding the medications uh, in my book, Boys Adrift, I talk about there's now lots of good scholarly research showing that medications like Adderall, Vyvanse, Ritalin, Concerta, Metadate, these medications damage the nucleus accumbens, the motivational center of the brain. We now have very good research in humans uh, showing that these medications actually shrink the nucleus accumbens in human beings. These are not safe medications, and yet this research is not well known to the prescribing physician. It is not well known to the parents. So you don't want your kid to be on those medications. There are other interventions that are safer. There are other medications that are safer if that is the diagnosis. But the video games are so immensely harmful in switching and in, in changing kids' motivation away from the real world into the virtual world. This boy no longer cares about getting an A instead of B in Spanish. He wants to finish all the missions in Grand Theft Auto or Call of Duty. Uh, so my first recommendation to parents is you've got to turn off the screens and limit, govern, and guide your kids' use of video games. It's your job. You cannot expect your son to do this. No pornography. If your son has a phone, you've got to install software like NetNanny or My Mobile a watchdog because the most common way that American boys are looking at porn is on their phone. Mm. And as I said, make sure the school is a good match for your son. And if it's not a good match, if it's not boy friendly, if boys are getting in trouble at that school for doing things that boys have always done, like uh, writing stories about World War II or pointing fingers at each other saying, bang, bang, you're dead, find a different school. Mm -hmm. And the earlier, the better. Well, that is wonderful, wonderful advice, and it's a great place for for us to land. There's so much to talk about, because as you were talking about video games and boys with ADHD, one of the things I find very commonly is parents with boys who have difficulty with school and who don't pay attention or they are hyperactive. They love these games. And parents will say, well, why can my son sit for five hours and do a video game, but he can't read or write? And I say, well, because the words on the page aren't jumping and talking to him and firing things. And we now have very good research where scientists have studied a big group of kids over a period of time and find very clearly the more time kids spend playing video games, the more likely they are subsequent 
subsequently to be diagnosed with ADHD. Mm. And it really makes you think that maybe the video games are causing ADHD. You really, and, and the American Academy of Pediatrics is right on top of this. And their latest guidelines came out in October for use of screens. Kids should not be looking at screens. And if they're looking at screens, it should be high quality screen time, like a parent and child watching the sound of music together. It should not be your son at six years of age in his bedroom playing a video game. And yet I see parents coming into the office and they're putting a screen in their kid's hand to distract them during the visit. So, you know, uh, and I get negative reviews uh, from parents as well who say, hey, I brought my kid in for a sore throat and Dr. Sachs gave me a lecture about how my kids shouldn't be playing video games all the time. Yeah. Yeah. But you know what? I think that's what you got to do. That's what you have to do. So you're really sort of saying we're creating attention issues. I think so. I think when you look internationally, why are kids in the United States 14 times more likely to have ADD compared to kids in uh, England and Scotland? I've done a lot of events in England and Scotland, and I can tell you, they have screens, but the parents don't let the kids play video games for hours at a time as a rule. One more question. It's a one-word answer because I get this all the time. How many hours a day is it okay for a child to be looking at a screen? 40 minutes a night on school nights, an hour a day on weekends. Those are the guidelines from Craig Anderson. Craig Anderson and Doug Gentile are the two scholars who've done the most work on video games. You'll find all that research in the new edition of Boys Adrift. Take a look at the chapter on video games. It is astonishing and terrifying, the new research on video games, showing that the more times boys spend playing video games, the more likely they are to have ADHD, the more likely they are to become obese, Mm. uh, the more likely they are to have poor social skills. Uh, So video games have a whole raft of these really negative consequences, and the research is just not getting reported on, which upsets me. On the contrary, the same week that one of these really terrifying studies came out, New York Times Sunday Magazine had a cover story that was basically a commercial for Minecraft about how wonderful Minecraft is and how creative kids are playing this game. Mm -hmm. They're not. You know, Melissa of Melissa and Doug, uh, Melissa Bernstein, she had a wonderful article for Time Magazine where she talked about taking her 11-year-old to a softball game with her siblings and Even a few years ago, the siblings would have been playing, they would have been interacting, they would have been playing tag, they would have been doing made-up games, but now they're all sitting looking at a screen. And and it was bases loaded, ninth inning, but nobody was cheering, nobody was paying attention. All the kids were looking at their screen. And Melissa said, you know what, we are destroying kids' creativity. Right. Yeah, Because a kid playing Minecraft is not creative. He's moving things around in a world a grown-up has made. That kid outdoors, making up a game with his friends, that's creative. Creating a story, that's where kids get creativity. And in my book, The Collapse of Parenting, I document there's been an astonishing collapse of creativity among American kids in the last 15 years. American kids are now less creative than American kids were 15 years ago. What happened over the last 15 years? Screens happened. Video games happened. And the consequences are scary, and a lot of parents just don't know. There you go. You've heard it from the master, (laughs) Dr. Leonard Sachs. Well, you have been so gracious with your time. Thank you so much. This has been wonderful. Thank you. So good, parents. Until next time, remember, great kids are raised. They're not born. Hey, this is Bobby, producer of Meg Meeker's Parenting Great Kids podcast. We hope you've enjoyed listening to episode 26, Raising Great Boys. And thanks to you, Dr. Meg's Parenting Revolution has grown to over a half a million downloads. You can like Dr. Meeker on Facebook and follow her on Twitter and Instagram at Meg Meeker MD. Just as a reminder, go to MegMeekerMD.com and sign up for her newsletter for giveaway opportunities and updates. And don't forget to share the podcast, write us a review, and click subscribe so you won't miss an episode. Dr. Leonard Sachs, welcome to the show. Thank you. All right, so you have spent your career researching and investigating how sex differences between boys and girls can affect their intellectual and emotional development and have been an advocate to do make policy changes to take those the new research about sex differences into account. And in fact, one of your books is called Why Gender Matters. 
And a popular idea out there is that you know gender really doesn't matter that much. Yes, there there could be some differences, but any differences that exist are negligible. Why does gender matter in the intellectual and emotional development of our children? Well, you certainly have described the political consensus, which is that gender doesn't matter. That gender is a social construct, and that anyone who says otherwise is either an idiot, a Republican, or both. Uh, but that's actually not the reality, and it's not what the data show. Uh, for example, give a blank piece of paper and a box of crayons to a child, four, five, six years of age. I cite studies in which researchers gave, did exactly that uh, in the United States, another study in England, another in South Africa, another in Japan, another in in Thailand, in each study, researchers gave young children a blank piece of paper and a box of crayons and asked them to draw whatever they want. Girls everywhere draw people, pets, flowers, and trees. Usually two, three, or four standing on a horizontal ground. The people have eyes, mouth, hair, and clothes. The girls use ten or more crayons with a predominance of red, orange, yellow, green, beige, and brown. Most boys, not all, but most boys do something quite different. Most boys are trying to draw a scene of action at a moment of dynamic change, like a monster eating an alien or a rocket smashing, a, a, a rocket smashing into a planet. Human figures, if present, are often stick figures, lacking eyes, mouth, hair, and clothes. The boys use six or fewer crayons with the predominance of black, gray, silver, and blue. Now, I have personally been in the classroom when the teacher has given a piece of paper and a box of crayons to all the girls and boys in her classroom. And she is praising and commending Emily and Melissa and Sonia and Vanessa for their pictures, uh, people, pets, flowers, and trees. But then she come, comes to Jacob's picture. And Jacob's trying to draw a car crash at the moment of impact where one car is being crushed between two others. And she says, no, Jacob, you know, a car crash. That's so violent, you know, and uh, people are going to get hurt or injured. And, Jacob, I actually don't see any people at all in your drawing. I can only see cars. Now, look at what Emily drew. And Emily had drawn a picture of a girl with a little puppy and another girl playing with a puppy. You know, why can't you draw something more like Emily? There's one thing that kids are equally good at, girls and boys, at every age, and that's figuring out what the grown-ups like. And it doesn't take the boys very long to figure out they're doing it wrong. I have visited now more than 380 schools across the United States and around the world. And I was in a second grade classroom in the United States where teachers had free time, you can do whatever you want. And some of the girls were sitting and coloring, and one of the boys was running around the room making a buzzing noise. And I stopped him. And I said, how come you don't want to sit and draw? And he said, without hesitation, he said, drawings for girls. Drawing is for girls. Where'd, she, where'd he get that notion? I'm sure the teacher never said drawing is for girls, but she might as well have. She's unintentionally sending the message that drawing is for girls. The lack of awareness of gender differences has the unintended consequence of reinforcing gender stereotypes. And when you look at who's taking AP art history in the United States at high school, you find that girls greatly outnumber boys, which is ironic, because most of the artists they're studying are men, but it works both ways. Ignoring gender differences, pretending that gender doesn't matter, disadvantages girls as well. In 1987, 66% of high school students taking AP computer science were boys, 34% were girls. Last year, only 19% of high school students taking AP computer science were girls. We've gone from 34% in 1987 dropped to 19%. Ignoring gender does not eliminate gender stereotypes. It reinforces gender stereotypes. You end up with what we have in this country, which is girls who think computer science is for boys and boys who think drawing is for girls. If you do it differently, then you can break down the gender stereotypes. And I can tell you about a superintendent of 17 elementary schools who insisted that all her teachers learn these strategies and she told us at the conference I hosted in Houston that at each of those 17 elementary schools, 
when you say to students, free time, you can do whatever you want. The boys' favorite activity now is drawing. Boys love to draw. Girls love to draw. I don't think there's any innate difference in how much kids love to draw. But there's a big difference in what boys want to draw compared to what girls want to draw. And if you don't understand those differences and pretend that they don't exist, you end up reinforcing gender stereotypes, as we have done in this country. Fascinating. So I imagine testosterone is the big cause of the difference of why boys are more action-oriented? Excuse me. Testosterone has nothing to do with the difference. There is no sex difference in testosterone levels among four, five, six, seven years uh, old children. Uh, Children at that age make very little testosterone, and there is no sex difference between the amount of testosterone in a five-year-old boy compared with a five-year-old girl. So why, why, why is the difference, though, there? The sex differences are not related to hormones. They are genetically programmed, and they are found across species. Uh, so, for example, the sex differences that I talk about are just as evident in chimpanzees and monkeys as they are in our species, further evidence that these differences are not socially constructed. Fascinating. So you've hit on a little bit about how teachers may inadvertently give the message to boys that the way they approach learning or what they do is not good. How else have American schools changed in the past 30 years that have put boys at a disadvantage? Indeed. Uh, That's a major focus of my book, Boys Adrift. So I recently visited a high school in this country, in the United States, and uh, parents were telling me about their son, high school English, 10th grade. The assignment was to write a story about anything you like. And this boy uh, chose to write a story about the Battle of Stalingrad, winter of 1942, from the perspective of a Russian soldier. And he researched it at, at, at considerable length uh, and described the Russian soldier patrolling a street when he was ambushed by a German soldier. And the Russian soldier fires his rifle at point-blank range into the face of the German soldier and then describes what happens when you fire a uh, military rifle at point-blank range in another man's face. What happens is that the head explodes and a piece of eyeball goes this way, a piece of chin goes that way, some brain matter goes this way. This boy was suspended from school, and the parents were told he could not return, and so the parents secured at their own expense a professional evaluation and a letter from the professional uh, assuring the school and the district that the boy posed no imminent danger to himself or to others. And when the parents shared that story with me, it really struck a chord because I attended public schools in Ohio, K-12, and and in 1977, our lead teacher for English at our high school uh, invited me and three other students to sit for a competition administered by the National Council of Teachers of English. And we were shown into a room, and the proctor gave us each a blue book and said, you have 45 minutes, write a story. I chose to write a story about East German refugees escaping to West Germany. When I, when I share this story with high school students today, I have to explain to them that Germany used to be divided in two, and and East Germans weren't allowed to to go to West Germany, which is news to quite a few of them. But anyhow, I imagined East German refugees trying to escape to West Germany, crossing a minefield in the middle of the night. And one of them steps on a mine, which blows blows off his left leg to the knee uh, and his right leg to the hip, so he now has no feet. He's crawling west, blood pouring out from the stumps where his legs used to be. The uh, East German guards, of course, have heard the noise and have... Uh, 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 turned their uh, flood lamps to try to uh, find him on the ground and are shooting uh, at him but missing. I described the bullets popping up little clouds of dust around him and West German guards are calling out encouragement to him. Of course, they're not allowed to go out into the minefield and he's crawling west and the the bullets are uh, going on either side of him and blood pouring out and finally he reaches the the border and the West German guards pick him up to take him to hospital, and at that moment he dies. The end. My own mom died in September 2008, and going through her papers after her death, I found that she had kept the certificate sent to our home address by the National Council of Teachers of English, awarding me their highest honor in creative writing. (laughs) Boys doing things that boys have always done, 
writing stories about traumatic amputation, violent death, drawing pictures of soldiers attacking each other with knives, uh, throwing snowballs at each other. Um, used to get you an award, or at least wouldn't get you in trouble. Now you can get expelled or suspended uh, for doing things that boys have always done. That's what I mean when I say that school has become unfriendly to boys. Interesting. So the zero tolerance policies, definitely not boy friendly. Zero tolerance policies for violence, meaning that if you bring a GI Joe with a plastic rifle to school, uh, you can be suspended. And I, in my book, I describe several such cases in which elementary school boys were suspended for, for bringing a plastic GI Joe sized gun to school. And the principal in each case said, look, it's a zero tolerance policy. That means I have no discretion. The policy says that any replica gun, regardless of size, mandates a 911 phone call and immediate suspension, and that's what I have to do. And the fact that he's five years old and that the gun is so small I have to tape it with scotch tape to the report doesn't matter. That's what zero tolerance means. We now know that zero tolerance policies are not effective. They do not in any way diminish actual school violence. They do substantially increase disciplinary referrals. And I think they do something else that's harder to, me to measure. They send the message to boys that your kind is not welcome here. You like to write stories about combat and World War II. That's not welcome here. And the boys are getting the message loud and clear. We're seeing a disengagement from education among boys uh, in every demographic, white, black, and Latino, affluent, middle-income, and low-income, which is without precedent in this country. And I can tell you stories from my firsthand experience of families where both mom and dad are professionals, uh, read in their spare time, their daughters read in their spare time, and the son told me he'd rather be boiled in oil than read a book in his spare time. <laughs> Uh, because his favorite his free time activity is playing Call of Duty, Grand Theft Auto, Halo. Wow. Um, how are some of the ways that boys and girls learn different? I think you mentioned in your book that competition uh, is important for boys. Well, again, the big differences between girls and boys are not cognitive but motivational. The big differences between girls and boys are not in what they can do, but in what they want to do. And that's really the key to understanding all the strategies which I've observed. And again, I didn't make up any of these strategies. They're all strategies I've observed in schools that are successful. Uh, so when you visit a school like Korowa in Melbourne, Australia, where you find that more than half the girls took AP physics, which is an astonishing figure and unbelievable, but true, you find they teach physics in a profoundly different way. They don't teach it the way it's taught in most of other English-speaking countries. They don't begin with kinematics. They begin, for example, with the wave-particle duality of light. Uh, when you find at schools where all the boys, or the, a great uh, majority of the boys, love to write uh, poetry and love to write uh, stories and love Emily Dickinson and Jane Eyre uh, and uh, uh, Jane Austen, you find that they teach it differently. Uh, so gender does matter, and uh, you do need to understand and learn from master teachers how to engage boys in creative writing and poetry uh, and how to engage girls in computer science and physics. And when you do that, you will find that you will break down gender stereotypes and you can greatly increase the proportion of boys who want to uh, spend their free time uh, reading Emily Dickinson uh, and girls who want to spend their free time writing computer code. However, it is unforgivable to speak these things in this country uh, because in this country what happens at schools of education is determined not by data but by politics and ideology. Mm. Do uh, our single-sex classes or schools uh, one solution of many that can help uh, break down those gender stereotypes? I used to think so and actually took a five-year sabbatical for medical practice in part to encourage uh, public schools to offer that option as a choice for parents who wanted it uh, when teachers have appropriate training. Uh, but I have pretty much given up on that. Uh, the uh, Obama administration appointed an ACLU attorney uh, to govern uh, 
this domain, and she has decided on her own, without any basis in law or regulation, that such programs should not be allowed in American schools. And uh, so she has uh, embarked on a witch hunt, again, without any justification in law or regulation, uh, to shut these programs down. And it's very difficult uh, with the federal government actively seeking to shut your program down uh, to sustain such a program in the United States. Hmm. And I guess it's a shame because I think I've read it not only benefits boys, but also girls because it's one of the problems that girls have in classrooms like physics or computer science is that they have that stereotype in their mind uh, that they're girls, they can't do this. Um, and then you, they see the boys raising their hands and jockeying for, you know, trying to make the answer. So they're less likely to participate, I guess, they found in all girls' yeah. classrooms. Uh, that was it. Yeah, that uh, critique uh, had uh, substantial empirical force 30 years ago. But that notion that uh, girls are intimidated because boys are raising their hand uh, really is disconnected from reality today. Uh, What's more common in American schools today is what I call Hermione Granger syndrome, where the the girl is waving her hand to to answer the teacher's question, and the boys are sitting on their hands, Mm -hmm. not speaking. That's much more common. But nevertheless, despite the fact that girls today are not intimidated by boys, look, I have met with students in hundreds of schools across the United States. And, for example, I was in a middle school where they had the regular honor roll, which is basically for kids who show up, and then the the principal's honor roll, which is for the kids who are doing really well. And there were 22 kids on the principal's honor roll at this particular school in the United States, 19 girls and three boys. And I asked the boys, can you explain to me why the principal's honor roll, which all the kids understood was the the superior honor roll, why why does the principal's honor roll have 19 girls and three boys? And many boys answered, and they all said the same thing. Girls are smarter. And they're not joking. American boys now believe that girls are smarter than boys, which is weird for me uh, because I'm a middle-aged man, meaning that I grew up in the United States in an era where when boys outnumbered the girls on the honor roll, when those earning honors at high school graduation from the valedictorian to the winner of honors in English to the editor. I was the editor of our high school newspaper. Uh, That's very rare today uh, to find a boy at a non-selective public school editing the high school newspaper. He might be editing the sports page, But across the United States today, when you look at who's editing the newspaper, the yearbook, uh, the poetry review, girls greatly outnumber boys. And this has gone on for so long now that when you ask boys why is this so, they answer uh, girls are smarter than boys. Hmm. So the 1970s analysis that girls are intimidated by boys in the classroom uh, really is not uh, valid today. And yet... Girls remain underrepresented in computer science, physics, electrical engineering, not because they're intimidated by boys, but because teachers have no idea how to teach those subjects to girls. Uh, You have to teach the content differently. It's not about relationships. It's not about making it pink. Uh, Again, my book, Girls on the Edge, focuses on how do you teach this content in a way that works for girls? not based on theory or MRI scans, but based on what actually works in the classroom to engage and motivate girls in computer science, physics, and electrical engineering. It's pretty well established now, but seldom used. Because, again, the notion, merely stating the uh, proposition that the best way to teach computer science to girls is different from the best way to teach computer science to boys, is politically unacceptable even if it is empirically very clear. Again, what is taught in schools of education is not based on data or empirical research. It's based on what is politically correct. Interesting. Um, So also in Boys Adrift, you talk about the uptick in ADHD diagnoses. Why is that happening? Why, Why are there more and more boys on ADHD medication? Right, and it's really dramatic, too, because... uh, In 1979, uh, we have a good paper published in Science Magazine showing that uh, about 1%, 1% of American kids uh, have been diagnosed with ADD. 
2013, the CDC published data showing that 20% of high school boys in this country have been diagnosed and treated for ADHD, which is astonishing. Uh, a, a, a boy in the United States uh, is about 14 times more likely than a boy in England to be treated for ADD. Um, and I encountered this myself, again, in my own practice. Uh, parents were stationed in England uh, for four years. Dad was a civilian contractor of the United States Air Force. He was working in England for four years. Their son was four when they went over and eight years old when they returned. The average student, uh, but within weeks of returning to public school in Pennsylvania, uh, mom told me uh, other parents and teachers were saying, you know, um, your son's, you know, not an outstanding student. Yeah, well, why don't you have him evaluated? Maybe, maybe he would benefit from being on medication. And it was like it was creepy. It was like everyone was, was on the payroll of the drug companies. This is, these are her words. Uh, why in the United States and not elsewhere? Uh, a kid in the United States, as I said, is much more likely to be on medication for ADD. A uh, kid in the United States is 40 times more likely to be uh, treated for bipolar disorder, 93 times more likely to be on antipsychotic medications like Risperdal or Zyprexa compared to a kid in Italy. Why? Uh, there's a couple things going on here. Um, one is the tendency in the United States uh, to regard medication as a first resort rather than a last resort. You know, kids misbehave in all countries, and I have visited schools in Australia, in England, in Canada, in uh, Mexico, in New Zealand, uh, in Scotland, uh, and I can tell you that kids misbehave in all countries. But if a kid in Scotland is, is uh, running around and throwing things, the teacher will say, it's quite enough of that nonsense. I expect you to sit still and be quiet. But in this country, it is very like, which, which is what a teacher in this country might have said 30 years ago. But today, a teacher in this country will say to parents, you know, uh, your child uh, might benefit from evaluation. He might benefit from medication. Have you thought of having him evaluated? And the parents will take him to the doctor. And in this country, the board-certified child psychiatrist will say, well, Let's try Adderall and see, and see if it helps, or Vyvanse. Uh, so there's been an explosion in the prescribing of medication, uh, and I explore the reasons uh, in my book, Boys Adrift, and in my forthcoming book, The Collapse of Parenting, which was initially titled The Collapse of American Parenting, uh, Why Most Kids we bet Would Be Better Off Raised Outside the United States. But uh, non-celebrity authors don't get to choose their titles, uh, and so that title was changed. The title of the book coming out in December is The Collapse of Parenting, uh, The Three Things You Must Do in Order for Your Child to Become a Fulfilled Adult. I, are there any detrimental effects of prescribing ADD medication to children who might not need it? Yes. Uh, well, there's de detrimental effects regardless of whether the child needs it or not. Okay. And I'm talking now about the stimulant medications, Adderall, Ritalin, Concerta, Metadate, Focalin, Daytrona, and the most popular one, Vedance. Sounds like a bunch of different medications, but it's actually just two, amphetamine and methylphenidate. Adderall and Vedance, the most popular medications, are amphetamines. They're speed. And these medications damage the motivational center of the brain, the nucleus accumbens. And I have 14 good studies, uh, uh, which I cite, uh, showing that these medications, even in low doses, uh, can damage the motivational center of the brain. And again, I describe uh, such a boy in my own practice, um, rolls out of bed late every day, uh, Mom got frustrated uh, with him one day and confronted him and said, you know, what's the story here? You, you, you wake up late every day, you work a few hours a week at the coffee shop, you're 27 years old. You don't have a life. You don't even have a girlfriend, for goodness sake. And, she, and he laughed. He said, well, I used to have a girlfriend. Uh, and she found out I only work a few hours a week at Starbucks. She dumped me. Uh, He's fine. Mom is pulling her hair out. Uh, she insisted he come talk to me. He's fine with that. He's known me since he was a kid. He was on Ritalin from nine years of age to 17 years of age, prescribed by a different doctor. That's the end result. When you damage the motivational center of the brain, the nucleus accumbens, you get a boy who looks fine, feels fine, perfectly content, 
he's got no drive. He's got no drive. He's perfectly content with his 55-inch flat screen, his online pornography, and his video games. Hmm. I mean, so what should parents do when teachers or counselors or other parents say, hey, maybe you should go get your, your son checked out? Because, I mean, that's a lot of social pressure. Yes, it is. Uh, I absolutely agree. And a parent in the, United, in the United States is under a lot of pressure. If your child is not performing at a high level, uh, you will start to hear those whispers, as this parent who returned from England described them. Uh, from other parents say you should have your son evaluated. Uh, and I really fought with the publisher to include uh, formal guidelines in my book, Boys Adrift, so that parents can decide on their own, does my child meet criteria for ADD? And the publisher really challenged me and said, are you suggesting, that, these are the exact words of the publisher to me uh, when uh, Boys Adrift was in production, are you suggesting the publisher said, that a parent, after reading your book, is competent to question the judgment of a board-certified psychiatrist. And I said, yes. I said, not only that, I'm saying a parent must question the judgment of a board-certified psychiatrist, because psychiatrists in the United States prescribe medication for just about every kid who walks in the door. So the moment you make that appointment, it is very likely that the doctor will hand you a prescription at the end of the appointment. And you must be the advocate for your child. And you must question the doctor's diagnosis and the doctor's uh, treatment. Because, again, in this country, medication is the first resort. Outside of North America, medication is the last resort. And the result is that we are experimenting on kids in a way which has no precedent. And, uh, you know, I was doing this talk at Grace Church School in Manhattan, and a father stood up and, and challenged me. He said, Dr. Sachs, he said, I just don't find this believable. He said, millions of kids are taking these medications. And you're suggesting that these medications damage the motivational center of the brain. I'm sorry, Dr. Sachs, I, I just can't buy that. If there was any truth to what you're saying, and I interrupted him, I said, if there was any truth to what I'm saying, you'd have heard this before from a more authoritative source than Leonard Sachs, a family doctor. You've heard, you'd have heard this from someone like Dr. Joseph Biederman, a chief of research in pediatric psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. And of course, Dad didn't know where I was going with this. And I said, you know, the same thought occurred to Senator Charles Grassley, United States Senate Judiciary Committee, who summoned Dr. Biederman to the United States Senate and said, Dr. Biederman, you've really been pushing Adderall hard. You have said that if a parent, uh, if a doctor prescribes Adderall for a child and the parent does not promptly fill and administer that medication, Dr. Beneman, you've said that parent should be considered for charges of criminal child neglect. Uh, Dr. Biederman, are you by any chance taking money from the drug companies that you've never publicly disclosed? But it turns out he was, uh, more than $1.6 million, according to his count. That count was never independently verified. Um, which is fine. He didn't break any law. Uh, a doctor can accept as much money as he wants to from the drug companies, and he's not breaking any law in the United States. But his action was unethical. He should have told us that he was taking this money, that he was functioning essentially as a paid spokesperson for the drug companies. Uh, but he's still a director of pediatric psychiatry research, at Harvard, despite all the articles in the New York Times uh, documenting how he took all this money. And it's not just Dr. Biederman. Uh, the, uh, doc, uh, Senator Grassley in his investigation had many of the leading lights of uh, American psychiatry come in. And, and the most chilling line of testimony, he asked one of these psychiatrists who had accepted millions of dollars and not disclosed it, why didn't you disclose it? And the, the psychiatrist said, well, because it's standard practice. Mm. It's standard practice. Those were his exact words. And I, that's very troubling. Uh, when the leaders of child psychiatry say that it's standard practice for the leaders of child psychiatry to accept millions of dollars from drug companies and not to tell us about it, uh, that's really troubling. Now, your local child psychiatrist isn't getting anything, I assure you. And I've given these talks to psychiatrists, and they are incensed that their leaders have sold out. Uh, that the leaders of child psychiatry in the United States at Harvard, at Emory, at the National Institute of Mental Health, 
have accepted millions from the drug companies, never disclosed it, and made these pronouncements without telling us that they were functioning as paid spokesmen, and they were all men, uh, paid spokes- spokesmen for the drug companies. Wow, that's incredible. You um, don't have that anywhere outside of North America. Yeah, so it's unique to the United States. Well, Dr. Sachs, this has been a, just a really fascinating discussion, and we didn't get to everything we could we could talk about because there's so much. Um, but where can people learn more about you and your work? Well, thank you. Uh, I just hired a professional web designer to bring my website into the 21st century. It's LarenceSachs.com, where you can see all the uh, presentations I'm doing and uh, uh, send me an email, and I do try to answer everyone if I possibly can. Fantastic. Well, Dr. Sachs, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thanks again. Our guest today was Dr. Leonard Sachs. He's the author of the book, Why Gender Matters, Boys Adrift, Girls on the Edge. You can find those all on Amazon.com. Go pick them up if you want. And also, you can find out more information about his work at LeonardSachs.com. And that's L-E-O-N-A-R-D-S-A-X.com. They use their media to assassinate real news. They use their schools to teach children that their president is another Hitler. They use their movie stars and singers and comedy shows and award shows to repeat their narrative over and over again. And then they use their ex-president to endorse the resistance, all to make them march, make them protest, make them scream racism and sexism and xenophobia and homophobia, to smash windows, burn cars, shut down interstates and airports, bully and terrorize the law abiding until the only option left is for the police to do their jobs and stop the madness. And when that happens, they'll use it as an excuse for their outrage. The only way we stop this The only way we save our country and our freedom is to fight this violence of lies with the clenched fist of truth. I'm the National Rifle Association of America, and I'm freedom's safest place. What makes America's military the most fearsome force on Earth isn't just the weapons, equipment, or technology. It's the flag beneath which we serve. From the shores of Tripoli and Normandy to the jungles of Vietnam and the streets of Baghdad and Kandahar, America's armed forces fight with courage, selflessness, and noble purpose unmatched and undefeated. We've always known that behind our line stands every hope for human freedom on this earth. So let me say this to all who serve or who have served. If you want to continue your fight to keep freedom alive, there's a nearly six million member force that will be truly proud to add your name to our ranks. I'm the National Rifle Association of America, and I'm freedom's safest place. We understand we live in a dangerous world. The enemies of freedom are real, and we need to be ready to defend all of our freedoms. Freedom to me is ability to live how I see fit to live. That's exactly what this country was founded on, was freedom. It is in danger. The elites and their ideology are destroying this country. We're losing the America that we all love. Gun rights are under assault. It's important that we fight for our freedom. We're in a critical state. We are freedom's safest place. The Second Amendment, after freedom of speech and religion, it was the first thing our founding fathers thought of. That is the pinnacle of freedom. It's about my safety, and I'm going to fight for my safety. I love the freedom that I have. I'm appreciative of the NRA for fighting for that freedom. And they're on the front lines doing something to defend our rights and the voice of the people. It protects law-abiding citizens. The work that the NRA does is important in preserving freedom and liberty. Keeping people informed, raising awareness about what's going on in the country. They are the protector of our freedoms. The NRA stands for freedom. In the face of this relentless onslaught of gun control schemes, you're the reason the Second Amendment still stands. You're the tip of the spear. You're the ones that make it possible for us every day to defend this freedom. They're fighting for our fundamental freedoms. I mean, I can't think of anything more important than that. One person to 
politicians in Washington is nothing, but together, as members of the NRA, we actually can have a voice. We must lead the way, and we must save our freedom. We're going to fight for the America we believe in. This is a fight for our freedom. We need to reawaken the passion and pride and unity of purpose that made this country so special. We're the National Rifle Association of America. We're born to fight, and we're not going anywhere. Stand up if you want to protect your right to protect yourself. Stand up if you believe in freedom. Stand up, and every day speak out. And we're going to stand for freedom and fight. We will not be silent.